Welcome to the Mindful Healers Podcast with Dr. Jesse Mahoney and Dr. Ni Cheng Lang. We are here to help you learn to pause and be present, awaken your breath, and harness the ripple effects of mindfulness for radiant health. We get you. We know you. We are you. We have both been successful on the surface, yet struggling underneath. We have both had cluttered brains, been overwhelmed, and exhausted. We're healers who have found solutions and want to share them with you. Join us here to discover a better way. Welcome to the Mindful Healers podcast. Today, we have another special guest episode. We're going to talk about how mindfulness can help ease the journey of caring for aging parents. A reminder that nothing that we share in this episode should be construed as medical advice. The intention of today's episode is to share with all of you the wisdom of one of my closest longtime friends who also happens to be a specialist in geriatric medicine and is my personal most trusted geriatric guide for my own journey with my aging parents. You'll discover that mindfulness can help smooth the journey of caring for aging parents with or without dementia. And the takeaways of today's episode are that staying in the moment is key. Caring for aging parents can span the spectrum of human emotions, from unbridled joy to soul-crushing sadness, grief, and frustration. So to start, we will introduce our special guest, who is Dr. Mary Norman. And Mary and I uh, met in medical school. We went to medical school together. And um, more than that, we were upstairs, downstairs neighbors through most of medical school residency and Mary's fellowship. And we had our children together. And during all that training, we pretty much shared refrigerators and dining room tables as the old sort of spirit of um, it takes a village. And so I am super excited to have her here today in a whole different part of our lives. And so I brought Mary on because Mary is a geriatric specialist. She did medical school at UCSF. She did internal medicine residency at UCSF and a geriatric fellowship at UCSF. And then sadly, she moved away for 20 years to practice geriatric medicine. But full circle, a few years ago, Mary also made a journey back to mindfulness. And that's what we are going to talk about today. She did a program through the Benson Henry Institute for Mind Body Medicine at Mass General and Harvard, and has since been bringing mindfulness into her work as a geriatrician. And I'm going to let you, Mary, explain what you did and what you do and a little bit about that as we delve into bringing mindfulness to caring for aging parents. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to this discussion. So my journey uh, as a geriatrician, I moved from California to Texas, and I worked for a company called Erickson Living, which is a senior housing living community, uh, but it's also a continuing care retirement community. And what that means is that we have, we cared for independently living seniors, but also to care for the whole spectrum, uh, assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, and long-term care. During the pandemic, I was responsible for about 1,200 uh, independently living seniors and another 100 or so that were in our, our long-term care facility. And also, at the same time, was a caregiver for my own family members um, with dementia um, during the pandemic, including relocating uh, loved ones, my father-in-law and mother-in-law from El Paso to Dallas, Texas. So as you, um, as we all know, during the pandemic, there was a lot of stress to go around. Um, and I was really seeking ways to help others, but also um, to take care of myself um, during the pandemic. And Thankfully, our, our company at the time was interested in partnering with Harvard um, and, and Mass General Hospital on a research project that was looking at the impact of teaching mindfulness techniques um, through the stress management and resiliency training program through the Benson Henry Institute, studying that 
to see how that would improve the outcomes of the seniors in an independently living um, community. And we had great success. Uh, I had great success personally, um, really studying these techniques and being able to apply them first to myself and then to see the magic of what happened um, when we were able to spread this throughout our community uh, through this training program. Uh, so it's an eight week training training program looking at various different, I would say, tools to put, put, put in your tool chest um, to develop more resiliency and what we said on um, the ultimate goal of flourishing uh, in our in our lives. And so this is a, a after doing this program and practicing geriatric medicine and now relocating to California, I had a chance to take a step back and think about the parts of medicine that brought me the most joy where I thought I could make the biggest contribution. And that's certainly in providing dementia care and education and combining that with mindfulness training. Uh, so I see so many caregivers that um, are, are stressed out and suffering. And to be able to make a, a education and educational program like this, uh, to be able to provide them the healing and the space and the tools that they need to be them, their best selves. So one thing you just brought up there, which I hadn't even thought about bringing into the podcast, but is really the perfect segue into the mindfulness is bringing the mindfulness to yourself as someone who was working in geriatrics during COVID, because I think that was a really particularly challenging place to practice medicine. And you were just last weekend telling me the stories of wearing the N95 and like having to go outside and breathe and having to practice medicine, having to practice mindfulness, like to take breaks, to get back to that. And I know you dealt with, for example, COVID outbreaks in your institution. And from our personal conversation on the beach last weekend, I've had my own journey with COVID and my own aging parents and their reaction to it. And they're not in a, um, an assisted living, but I think this is something that's very universal and just this idea of bringing it to the caregiver to me is a beautiful space to focus on, but also ourselves as caregivers, not just as someone who helps caregivers care for others, but to ourselves as caregivers. Yes, you're exactly right. I mean, my biggest take home was I can't, I can't really be present for other people unless I really take the time to be present for myself. And, uh, you, you know, thinking about that, you know, the experience of wearing, putting on the N95 mask and what you need to do to prepare yourself to do that, to walk into it. And it, the mindfulness techniques of taking a deep breath and having had some time and taking care of myself before I got to um, the work and where I was in the position to put on the mask. And then, and, and then also taking breaks throughout the day. Uh, we, you know, our meditations, we call that the minis where you just breathe for a couple of breaths, deep breaths, and clear your mind. Um, just the very simple tools like that um, allowed me to face each new challenge differently. Uh, and, and what we saw throughout the training with the caregivers uh, was that was certainly very, um, very important for them too. And for us, we this was a feasibility study, our seniors able to pick up this tool? Is it going to be as meaningful for them as it is for us? And overwhelmingly, their response was was positive. And yes, that these tools are, are universally needed and helpful. I have a question about that. Actually, I hear from a lot of people who reach out to me about coaching mindfulness and yoga. And many people say, am I too old for this change? <laughs> and I, of course, say no, but you're the geriatrician. So I'm curious I mean, to me, the mind is malleable at any age. I know that older minds are maybe a little less malleable, but I almost feel like it's more needed as we have more physical challenges and the world becomes more just unsettling as we get older. And I think you're, I think you're spot on. Um, what I was uh, really pleased to see is that so many um, people had used techniques similar to this. This is not something, some new technique that we've just developed. These, these uh, techniques have been part of major religions and been around for thousands of years. And what I found was by teaching a variety of different options and, and looking at art and music and exercise and fellowship with other people and laughing and game playing, as all these things are, are tools for us um, to 
really elicit that relaxation response uh, and, and give ourselves that needed rest um, that we need. Um, so for seniors, I found that not only were they able to learn and benefit from new techniques, but many of them uh, were able to pull back and say, you know what, I used to do meditation years ago, um, and I just haven't done it in a long time. And thank you for reminding me of the importance, and it's really helping me now. And I think that's true of a lot of us that we 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 think back of, of things that helped us throughout our lives. Whether uh, for me, I was a, a a golfer. I played a lot of golf growing up, uh, and I played piano growing up. And and after this course, I went back to both of those things and said, oh, "This is this is why I love them so much." Um, was because it it gave me a, a place and a way to recharge, um, and it more things to add to to my tool chest. Uh, tool chest for resiliency um, and mindfulness. So I would love to hear last weekend, um, we were visiting together, which was the impetus for this podcast. And we were talking about the journey you're about to embark on and trying to come up with names for it. And so um, the name that I think you're going with, um, but I would love to understand. And I, I, what I took from our conversation that was so valuable is all of the very pertinent words that I love came up and are sort of tossing around what would be the right name for your journey ahead. And so um, why don't you share what what you ultimately came up with in the middle of the night and also um, the why of it and why that is just the right thing for, for what you're planning to do. So after much contemplation and many uh, and much gratitude to Jess for going through uh, many iterations with me, I chose just this moment. And as I pondered all the different things that I could call I call my program, which will be both education and mindfulness training, just this moment seemed to capture it. Um, for much of our um, lives, uh, we have sort of those monkey brains where our minds are going in so many different um, directions. As a physician, uh, as a woman physician, uh, we are very uh, adept at multitasking. And I found uh, that it was very hard to be the effective, to have the right presence and to be able to provide the right healing, especially um, during the chaos of the pandemic, unless I focused on the moment at hand. And my, my mantra used to be kind of one day at a time, um, one visit at a time. And then once the tsunami of the pandemic came, I was like, okay, I need to, I need to break this down even further. Uh, it's just this moment. And that was a, that was a, enabled me to be highly effective, to be an active listener, to be the caregiver I wanted to be, to be the physician I wanted to be um, in the moment. So we pondered a lot of other names um, too when we went through. Uh, we looked at uh, joyful caregiving, um, we being the present care caregiver, um, not pause and presence. We didn't want to <laughs> do that, but but tell about um, joy filled caregiving because that was the one. Someone yes. already had it. I think if that hadn't been taken, we would have probably landed there. Although I like just this moment with its, um, it just really captures the mindfulness piece, but. The joy-filled um, caregiving uh, just struck me because I've never thought of caregiving as joy-filled. And so setting that intention felt really loving. Yes. So uh, one of the things that I found uh, that I found during the pandemic and, and throughout medicine is when I became more stressed, I would miss the joy, the, the I called them magic moments or really joy-filled moments. But that was a, a point that I missed the opportunity to see the smile on my um, on my patient's face, or I I didn't even listen to the joke that someone was telling me because my mind was was somewhere else. And with caregivers, I see that all the time that there's so many stressful moments of caregiving, but then in the midst of all this, there's joy surrounding, um, and just and just funny and just funny moments like. Um, you know, I look, I listen, I learned a lot from my in-laws as they came here and they were adjusting, um, adjusting to a new, a new environment. And my mother-in-law actually went through this class, um, as well. 
And so when she first came, everything that she faced was a stressor and she was depressed and moody and there was absolutely no joy in anything that she was doing. Um, and then after the course or during the course, you slowly started to see these joy filled moments kind of popping up here and there. And she became more creative in the way that she cared for my, um, my father-in-law. Um, she started you know, putting um, pictures of the grandkids around and, and taking the moment to make his, to make their day joy filled by starting out with, uh, you know, looking at the grandkids and saying a prayer for them. He's a Baptist preacher. So for them, that was um, one of the most important things they could do was to take that moment. Um, and that joy filled moment became larger to where the appreciation and the gratitude and, um, and really reaching out to others became what was the bulk of their day instead of struggling with, I can't believe he forgot that today's his doctor's appointment. Um, and it really just shifted, shifted the, the caregiving mind to look for the joy instead of focusing on what you have to do or what you, your loved one can no longer do. Which seems super relevant, I think, for us as caregivers. But also, um, one thing that's coming to mind here is, you know, we care for patients, but we don't often, as physicians, care for the caregivers. And so that has been one of the passions of mine. And of course, in pediatrics, we sort of do, as we're caring for parents. Um, and I have been doing a lot of work for um, women who partners have struggled with mental health and caring for them as caregivers. And so this kind of fits in that same um, genre of caring for caregivers. And I'm guessing you too, Ni Cheng, do that in your pulmonary clinic as well. Yeah, my pulmonary clinic is vastly geriatric in its patient population. And so almost always uh, my geriatric patients have their caregivers come with them to the clinic visit. Um, and we know actually from literature that lung cancer patients not only benefit from mindfulness, but also their caregivers benefit mm -hmm. from mindfulness as well. And this applies to, of course, different types of patients with cancer and their caregivers. And you do on. mindfulness in your clinic too. Do you teach caregivers as well? I don't think I ask, I've ever asked that question. <laughs> so if they happen to be in the clinic visit with me, I invite them to also practice with the patient at the same time. Beautiful. So let's pivot a little bit to talking about caring for aging parents. And I think I'd like to center it around this idea of mindfulness, like how mindfulness can help us as um, for ourselves in caring for um, aging parents. And then maybe a few, your, your tools for me personally stemmed around mindfulness as well. So I'll share a few of those and you have more to share, I think. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Mary? Yes. So I, I have been um, a caregiver for grandparents and in-laws and my own parents. And uh, all of these techniques are very useful for us in our own care. Uh, and the theme is the same. It has to start with yourself. Uh, I, I think I share with, with um, Jess, one of my favorite, favorite sayings is the serenity prayer. Um, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change those things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. So, yeah, that's a that's not something I've said my whole life, and I really thought it was just kind of a straight line that you just you were just able to get to wisdom and and what I found, um, you know, as I've grown wiser with age, I think, is that we're constantly trying to figure out. Is this something I'm supposed to accept? Am I supposed to be serene with this? Am I supposed to be courageous and try to change it? And it's balancing those three things, uh, I think, is really the art in being a, a successful caregiver for our own loved ones, um, and even more so. Uh, I, I find that when I'm out of balance, and because I'm a physician, I think I have the ultimate wisdom that that usually was what got me in trouble um, instead of really figuring out what that what that balance was supposed to was supposed to look like um, and and so sometimes it means that um, you it always means 
that you have to walk this walk with your loved one. And I'll, I'll actually use that that terms with my family members and also my caregivers as well. And I start you know, really with this underlying before I walk into a room um, or or into a conversation of taking them taking some time to to settle and and to really remember why I'm there. Uh, my number one goal as a family member um, caring for someone I love is to honor them. My number one goal as a, a physician caring for a family and patient is to honor them um, and their goals of care. Um, and I, I think that is, uh, you know, a very powerful statement. Sometimes I'll walk into a discussion with families or my own family, and there's so much emotion in the room um, that there's so much, you know, fear and anger and disappointment um, that you have to find a way to, to be on the same page, to agree on one thing. And I've yet to have a family member or a, a patient in their family say, when I say my, my number one goal is to honor you, um, I've never had anyone say, no, 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 that can't be the number one goal. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's always a, it's a great place to, a great place to go. And then to look at their goals of care. Um, and, you know, sometimes um, our goal, my goal for my parents was very much different than, um, than their goals for themselves. So for instance, for my, um, my father, he very much wanted to keep my stepmom who had advanced dementia in their home. Um, and, and I did not think this was the right thing to do. And, and it, it clearly would have been, um, she could have gotten uh, potential, she could have gotten you know, better medical care by the book. Um, it's certainly, I could have supported my dad better. Uh, I could have been more involved. Now, do you notice my train of thought? I'm saying I, 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 I. Um, and so that's a moment where I was like, wow, that's not, that's not what he wants right now. Um, to be a good family giver, I need a family caregiver. I need to look at what his goals of care and say, how, how is it? Can I, how can I help in that situation? And um, Jess, you and I talked about that idea of harm reduction. So the safest place for to be for my mother, my mother-in-law would have been to move them to Dallas earlier in the course of the disease and to have her in a specialized memory care program and to um, have my dad have great primary care that I could control. That's not, that's not what he wanted. So, but maybe I started and what we did do is we started with a kind soul who came in and was a friend to my mother-in-law and gave my dad um, respite to do one of the things he really enjoyed doing, which is going to the grocery store by himself. Um, and, and so we started with, with small goals like that, that reduced the harm, provided some um, respite and care. Uh, and it took, it really took time to layer on support as time went on and, and trust and, and trust that really my goal was, was not, um, to make my life easier and feel like a good daughter. My, my, my goal was to help them have the best life that they could have together. And it's, it's hard. It, I, I think as physicians, we feel, I know I felt even more responsibility. I know the ideal way, to, the, all the, all the ideal ways to care for someone with dementia. And, and I couldn't do that by the book for my parents um, at all points in the course of the disease. Well, guess what? That's, that's true. <laughs> Most of our interactions as, as caregivers is we kind of know where we think the end goal is, but do we really have that, that shared um, goal setting? So that would be, I think, one of the, the, big, the biggest things I, I took away from it. Um, and then my mother-in-law taught me a very important thing she took from her course, which um, in, as we're struggling and prioritizing what things we're going to try to uh, intervene on most, um, she, she said, oh, it, oh, just derm, Mary, does it really matter? Um, and and then, <laughs> as the first time she came up with that, I was like, "What is she talking about?" And and, and it was a it was a beautiful um, reminder that hey, we're 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 all in this together. Uh, we have to take one moment at a time and and prioritize and and work together for the common good. Well, you taught me that um, it isn't about what I want or what I think is best. It's about what they want and what they think is best within reason. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, but this idea of harm reduction, I think, is very freeing as a child of aging parents. And I'm brought back to my question of like, what would love do? And love wouldn't try to make them do the things I want them to do, even if I know they're right. Um, I see this a lot in parenting the other way around. We're like, yes, but I'm right. It's like, well, okay, but that doesn't get us very far. And that's where I think the mindfulness, it's hands wide open, but also, Nichang, you said something about this the other day, hands wide open with a foundation of love or filled with love, or it was really beautiful. And that's what's coming to mind again here. Yeah, hands wide open atop the word love. So building upon the foundation of love, the mindfulness has the backing of love and warmth and kindness to the noticing. The other thing we were talking about in a recent episode is the idea of non-judgment. And I think that's got it. I mean, that's a central component to mindfulness. And as I say that, I'm like, oh, I have to work on that. Um, and, and we mean the judgment from this, again, place of wisdom and expertise, especially I think as physician children of aging parents, it's like, but I know this is not the right thing or you're making the wrong choice, but that isn't the um, healthiest, most connecting way to approach it. You're, you're exactly right. And you know, the other, one of the other things that I found most um, beautiful about the time in the pandemic and I, if I gave everybody a, a question, I bet you wouldn't get what I found. Um, with all the chaos in a senior care retirement community, with COVID, you know, COVID outbreaks and illness and isolation, the most peaceful place on um, campus was actually our memory care unit. And it really um, came back and that was a surprise to me. It was my favorite place to go. I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll go. I'm going to round in the memory care unit today because we had very special caregivers and they knew that the most important thing that they did was provide love and calmness in that environment. Uh, and our memory care patients didn't know that there was a pandemic. They didn't know what COVID was. They didn't, they were just living in the moment and as long as we created an environment um, that was surrounded, that was focused on love, um, that we shielded them um, from the stress of everything that was around. And it taught me, it taught me a lot of, of like, wow, that's that's how we should approach every relationship um, and every interaction um, with with those that we're trying to provide care for and care with. Uh, and, and so that was a great, that was a great lesson and great su- surprise for me. Uh, and that's a, it's certainly a kudos to our um, frontline caregivers in that situation that they had had some training like this. And so they were skilled in, in what they needed to do and what they needed to bring uh, when they came um, into that area and to provide the, their best care. Any other thoughts, questions to bring up, things you think that we should share with our listeners about taking care of our aging parents mindfully? Um, It's interesting because uh, after listening to this, I'm thinking, wow, it's um, harder than I thought. And yet I also think I have more tools than I thought. Um, So it's a little bit of like the good and the bad. I'm like, oh, this is like a real journey, which I knew. Um, but maybe I had been in a bit of denial and that there are all these tools that can help. Yes. I mean, I, I think, you know, when I think about the things that are in my, my tool chest and what's helped me um, with not only my patients, but with my, my family members uh, is, is, you know, really t- taking time to understand where they are, uh, to understand what they're feeling at that moment and to ask about it. Uh, and not assume that uh, I know what's going through my mother-in-law's head when she's caring for the loved one. Um, and and then um, truly not having my agenda so set when I come for a visit and to really sit back and just listen and what's most important for her. And those things rarely align. Um, and I'm constantly um, humbled by um, the little things that I could do that make a big difference for her. Uh, I, the most important thing may be uh, when I'm home back in Texas to take care of the dry cleaning, or the last time it was she wanted the picture reframed, or uh, my father-in-law had a sore foot and really needed um, a new, different pair of shoes. Uh, and 
you know, I wanted, maybe I wanted to provide all this great education on the management of Alzheimer's disease for them, but, but that was not the most, and that was not the most important thing. Uh, and when I, I met them exactly where they were, uh, what I saw was uh, definitely more relaxation, more joy, um, and humor. Uh, you know, just the being able to laugh together again, uh, and and that peace um, that you saw with them um, feeling comfortable that they can trust me for whatever concern they have, and that I'm going to take care and prioritize their their needs. Um, and when you do that, guess what? They're going to be more open. They are more open to things that I say are really important, and and that I might think help most. Uh, this this course, taking this course was was one for my mother-in-law that she had no particular interest in taking it. Um, but she trusted she trusted me because we've had so many other things that we've worked together on at this moment, and I had prioritized so much of what of what was most important to her that she trusted me um, with this course that I think made a huge difference for her. It's bringing me back to yoga this morning and the theme of yoga was peace begins with you. And I, as you were talking about that, I was like, oh, it's the energy that we bring that non-judgment or neutrality or peace. Or when you brought up humor, I thought of the loving amusement that we've talked about a few times recently. Like that's perfect for our aging parents. I think that's a great, a great comment. I know I have that feeling where you feel and, and somehow parents can do this to us more than any other person. You, you know, they say something, some comment, and you feel that kind of warmth coming up from your chest, you know, boom, the flush coming up. Um, and you, that's exactly right. I, I think I'm much more mindful of, wow, that that was a button. I need, I need to figure out why that was a button for me but what the most important thing I need to do right now is take a couple of deep breaths and not not say something or think something I shouldn't um until I until I figure it out so yeah I think the journey of caring for your love or your family members in particular brings up a lot of um you know personal issues that you need to take some time time with mindfully um, consider and and allow yourself to feel um I think that's that's another important thing um you, you know growing up uh in at Louisiana, you know, one of the things was that you, you, you weren't supposed to feel sad. You weren't supposed to, um, there was a lot of things you weren't supposed to do. You should, you should. And, and I think coming, coming through this program, it's like, you shouldn't shit on yourself. Don't shit on yourself. Um, you let yourself feel what you're feeling, but then explore why you're feeling that way. And that's the only way you're going to be able to really show up the way you want to show up for your loved ones. Those are such wise reminders, Mary, and you bring up curiosity, curiosity for yourself when those difficult emotions arise, and also curiosity for your parents, like those simple questions of what can I do for you right now in this moment, and then dropping your own agenda that you have for your aging parents and simply framing that picture that they want this whole discussion. And first of all, thank you, Mary, so much for being here and for sharing your insights, both personally and professionally. So for your dear listener, in thinking about your aging parents or relatives that you care for or will care for, what's arising for you? What different thoughts and what different feelings are coming up? How might you bring in mindfulness in your caring for them and for yourself in caring for them? And thank you so much, Mary, again, for being with us today. Can you tell our listeners how they can find you and get in touch with you? Yes, I am actively building out my own um, website, but for now, uh, email me with any questions, concerns, and, or uh, interest in the program that I described at mary, mary at dr com d-r-m-a-r-y-n-o-r-m-a-n.com um, and thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to share this time with with both of you and with your followers this was super fun to bring mary on and come full circle and have this conversation and all of the um, information for how to contact Mary will be in the show notes. And we want to thank all of you 
for listening. If you enjoyed listening, we would appreciate it if you would leave us stars and reviews and share the podcast with anyone who might benefit from this episode, pretty much anyone who has an aging parent, which is almost all of us, and any of our other episodes, or for those who are interested in learning more about mindfulness and living with intention. Stay on after the sound of the singing bowl for our mindful moment offering. As always, if you want to declutter your mind, be more present, and start truly living your one wild and precious life, come find us at the mindfulhealerspodcast.com. Work with one of us. Work with both of us. Start or up-level your mindfulness practice. Discover how mindful coaching can change your life. Or even better, do both as part of our Mindful Healers programs and retreats. You can find links to find out more about our programs and join our communities at themindfulhealerspodcast.com. Reach out and get started on your journey to a life better lived today. The content of this podcast is not meant to be medical or life advice. If you choose to participate in our mindful moments, please do so safely. Welcome to today's mindful moment. I invite you to share in this loving kindness meditation with me today. As we begin, make yourself comfortable. Gently lower your gaze or close your eyes. Just notice your breath moving in and out. Take three deep inhalations and exhalations and allow your body to relax. Now bring awareness to your own self, your own heart, and repeat with each breath. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I be happy. May I live with ease. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I be happy. May I live with ease. Now bring to mind someone that you care for, a family member, a friend, a patient, and extend these wishes to them. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you live with ease. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you live with ease. Now bring your mind to our larger community. Our healthcare members who work so hard to to improve the lives of others. May we all be safe. May we all be healthy. May we all be happy. May we live with ease. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be happy. May we live with ease. Now gently bring your attention back to the present moment. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes if they have been closed. Thank you so much for sharing this mindful moment with us today.